Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here is what we have in the bulletin. OUR spearheading post-burial assessment of the country's electricity resilience. Soldier gunned down while on duty in West Kingston. And later in sports, Mount Pleasant head coach fired after one game in charge. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kerry and Simpson. Here are the details. Amid public, public backlash about its handling of issues relating to customers of the Jamaica Public Service Company following the passage of Hurricane Beryl, the Office of Utilities Regulation has indicated that it is spearheading an in-depth post-burial evaluation of the resilience of the electricity sector. The OUR says this will span preparation for the hurricane, its impact and restoration activities. Prince Moore has the details. In a media release yesterday, the OUR said the assessment will seek to identify culpability, gaps, areas for improvement, policy and legislative recommendations to ensure the resilience of the utility infrastructure, improved communication with stakeholders, and enhanced disaster recovery. This should provide a basis for further policy and legislative recommendations as deemed necessary. In the meantime, the OUR says it is continuing to engage with the Jamaica Public Service Company to ensure the restoration activities in St. Elizabeth are expedited and that power is restored to all customers. The OUR says the latest report from the JPS on Wednesday indicated that 3,247 customers in St. Elizabeth remained without electricity. JPS says electricity was restored to 34,549 or 91.4% of its St. Elizabeth customers between Monday and Tuesday. And a total of 37 customers in pockets of communities in Westmoreland, Manchester, Clarendon, Portland and St. Thomas remain without power as JPS claims they are awaiting the resolution of specific obstructions to have their power restored. A St. Elizabeth community is questioning the reason behind the double murder of a common-law couple in Mountainside this morning. It's understood that the couple were pounced on by armed thugs sometime after 3 o'clock. More in this report. It began as a day like any other for Sharon Calder, a craft vendor who operates in Montague Bay, St. James. Like clockwork, she was out early to head to her craft shop, but gunmen would not have it. It's understood that about 3.45 this morning, Miss Calder and her common-law husband, Richard Foster, were making their way through Mango Walk Lane in Mountainside when loud gunshots were heard. When the shooting ended, the body of Miss Calder was seen by residents in the lane, her common-law husband was found meters away in bushes. It has left the once quiet St. Elizabeth community in shock. Her brother, Carlton Calder, is hoping that those responsible for her murder will be caught and brought to swift justice. The market is going on selling baskets, you know. Mm -hmm. Craft market, you know. She was selling baskets and... And, and go to, I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I when I hear the sound out there, I don't go out there. But I say, I say to him, say, where did my brother shot at the madman for? And when I realize, I, I'm my boyfriend. You understand me? He's a good man, man, nice man, man. Sweet and nice, bossy, if you're treating me to yet. I'm a sister, I'm a good man. I tell you, say, I'm good. Head of the St. Elizabeth Police, Superintendent Coolridge Minto, says this morning's act is surprising, as the community has not had any such incidents for over a year. And so the residents of this area are very concerned and certainly not accustomed to this type of incident in this space. So we're appealing to anyone who may have any information at all on this gruesome act to share with the police any information at all that you have. It doesn't matter how slight it is or how minor you think it is, please share it with the police. Hal Shane Burke, TVJ News. A Westmoreland taxi operator was shot and killed and his wife wounded after a gunman invaded their home at Water Lane in George's Plain Thursday evening. The deceased man has been identified as 70-year-old Reynold Madden. 
Mr. Madden is said to have plied the Negril to Savlamar Road. According to the police, the elderly couple was at their home with other relatives when a motorcycle stopped at their gate with a lone rider. The gunman disembarked the motorbike with a firearm and entered the house through the front door. TVJ News understands that he then opened gunfire, hitting the couple before escaping on the same motorcycle. The wife and husband were rushed to a hospital by residents who where Mr. Madden, who was suffering from gunshot wounds to his left shoulder and left upper back, was pronounced dead on arrival. Meanwhile, his wife was admitted in critical condition as she received gunshot wounds to her left side of as she received gunshot wounds to the left side of her neck. The police are investigating. The Jamaica Defense Force JDF has confirmed that a service member was shot and killed while on duty early this morning. The incident happened inside the Denham Town Zone of Special Operation in Kingston. Reports are that around 1.30 a.m., the soldier was patrolling along Bond Street when he was shot by armed men. He was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. He has been identified as E.J. Dumville. The Chaplaincy and Welfare Department is providing counseling and support services to the soldier's family and colleagues. The JDF has also extended condolences to the family of the deceased soldier. Now, anyone with information regarding this incident is encouraged to contact Crime Stop at 311, the National Intelligence Bureau, NIB, at 811. We will have more on this story in Primetime News at 7. Acting Senior Superintendent of Police in charge of the Clarendon Division, Shane McCullough, is assuring residents of Clarendon that the force is working to return normalcy in the parish. The assurance follows the mass shooting just over a week ago in Cherry Lane District in the parish. We have been carrying out a number of targeted operations under the SOE as recently as yesterday the two persons who were picked up in the ongoing operations and investigations have been charged for the murders and shooting in Cherry Lane. The necessary intervention and support for the victims of crime that is also ongoing. He says more persons are being pursued by the police. One man was killed in a police confrontation during an operation on Thursday. We just want to reassure the public that we are continuing the hunt for these men, whether they are in Clarendon or they are outside the borders of the parish. The government says it is committed to improving water supply across the country. The latest assurance came from Portfolio Minister Senator Matthew Samuda. Persons in the northwestern end of the island are among those to benefit from improved water supply, with work set to take place on the major transmission main in Martha Bray Trelawney. Minister with Responsibility for Water Matthew Samuda gave the update during a recent tour of St. James. The minister also explained he is still not satisfied with Jamaica's water supply, noting that in many parts of the country, 70% of water is lost to theft or damaged pipes. Water doesn't see parish boundaries, it doesn't see constituency boundaries, it's sourced to where people live. So Martha Bray, all the way to west end of the westernmost parish, Westmoreland, we'll see upgrades of its transmission mains starting at the end of this year, going over about 18 to 24 months, depending on the construction time. That project will see investment of 160 million US dollars. Now that will fix the supply issue. And as for the issue of non-revenue water, particularly in some western parishes like St. James, Hanover and Trelawney, he had a solution. We have already gone to tender internationally with the support of the World Bank technical team for a national non-revenue water partner, which will see a PPP, meaning that we'll have a partner that works with us to identify the major leaks and to install those major transmission mains, put in pressure monitors so you don't have this constant up and down in pressure, especially when you have drought, etc. that monitor so you have less breaks, and you also put in significantly more meters that measure the water flow at different places. That 10-year project, because that's what a non, the National Non-Revenue Water Project, 
will run anywhere between three and 500 million US dollars. The minister said if the government continues to meet its targets, the water network in the country will soon be the best Jamaica has seen in nearly 40 years. Kerry and Simpson, TVJ News. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. The opposition People's National Party is again reiterating calls for an improved road maintenance fund to repair the critical infrastructure across the country. In an interview with TVJ News, opposition spokesman on transport Mikhail Phillips argued that the $40 billion spark program is not enough. What we need right now is a more comprehensive approach to road construction and maintenance. We have been calling, the People's National Party has been saying that we need to relook at, at a road maintenance fund in how it is that we maintain not only our roads but our bridges. Mr. Phillips adds that the yearly allocation to, rep to repair and maintain bridges is inadequate. He pointed to the length of time it's taking to fix bridges, such as the Woodsville Bridge in Hanover and the Troy Bridge on the Manchester Trelawney border. What needs to happen is really just government taking interest in the amount, the over 300 bridges that we have island wide that are in disrepair. There are many of them not only in disrepair, but they are in conditions that vehicle traffic or pedestrians should not be using them. It's now time for the Business Minute. Local manufacturing and distribution firm Separate says it made a lower profit of $941.48 million for its second quarter ended June 2024. In the same period last year, the company made $1.19 billion after tax. The company says that this was mainly due to a shortfall in its Trinidad subsidiary AS Bryden, with its net profit down 44% due to expiration of one-off benefits which the company had in 2023. Separate says, however, it realized higher revenues of $29.74 billion in the three months ended June 2024, a 9% increase compared to the $27.39 billion made in revenue for the period ended June 2023, a 27% rise in export sales supported the growth. Further afield, housing demand in the U.S. improved in July after declining for months. The National Association of Realtors says sales of previously owned homes in the U.S. grew 1.3% in July from the month before. That pushed the seasonally adjusted annual rate of nearly 4 million home sales. July's figures broke a four-month streak of declining sales. But year over year, the sales were down 2.5% in July from 2023. The National Association of Realtors says despite the modest gain, home sales are still sluggish. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Nikinski Robinson. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, Haitian police arrested a 52-year-old man in connection with the murder of two American missionaries and a Haitian citizen at an orphanage on May 22. The police will release a full report on the case in the coming days. The victims, Natalie and Davy Lloyd, daughter and son-in-law of Missouri legislator Ben Baker, were serving as missionaries in Haiti when they were attacked by an armed gang. A Haitian citizen working at the orphanage also died in the incident. On the international scene, a transgender woman from Australia has won a discrimination case against a women-only social media app after she was denied access on the basis of being male. The federal court found that although Roxanne Tickle had not been directly discriminated against, she was a victim of indirect discrimination, which refers to when a decision disadvantages a person with a particular attribute and ordered the app to pay her $6,700 plus costs. It's a landmark ruling when it comes to gender identity. And the U.S. Supreme Court has granted a Republican request to partially reinstate an Arizona law demanding proof of American citizenship for voter registration. In a 5-4 ruling, justices reinstated part of a 2022 law that rejected such forms if the voter did not provide proof of citizenship. 
The law's full revival would have excluded more than 41,000 people from voting in November's election between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. The administration of President Joe Biden, who won Arizona in 2020 by just over 10,000 votes, had sued to stop the law. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Hal Shane Burke. We head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report with Jeremy Brown.